church. Glad to be here this morning to worship my Lord and Savior. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Let us all sing. There's one Lord and one faith and one baptism. There is only one Lord and one faith and one baptism. There is only one Lord and one faith and one baptism. I'm going to tell you.
Rusty Skipworth, and I am the Youth and Children's Minister here at Naperville Church of Christ. We are so glad that you are here this morning. Here are a few things going on at Naperville. There's something for everyone on Wednesday nights, including BAM, Bible, Art, and Me for grades 6 and under. We also have youth and adult classes. So join us for a meal at 6.30 and classes starting at 7. Join us on Friday, March 15th at 6.30 for free family movie night in the gym. We will be showing The Wizard of Oz and concessions will be available. Courtney Ann McMillan, the Children's Ministry Director at Greenlawn Church of Christ in Lubbock, Texas, will be here on April 6th to lead us through the Empower Teacher Training Workshop. The Empower Teacher Training Workshop is for anyone looking to make a positive impact on children's lives, whether it be as a parent, a caregiver, a friend, or a teacher. This workshop is free for all members of Naperville Church of Christ. Make sure to sign up in the foyer today. 1014 Youth Ministry meets on Sunday nights from 6 to 8 p.m. right here in the center for a time of fun, worship, and study. Bring a dollar or two for concessions. Hey guys, uh, wanted to give you a quick update. We're down in the final hour at our 2019 Extended Hand and Feet and uh, wanted to just express my great um, love and appreciation for the, the effort that you guys have put forth uh, in this event. It's really just a remarkable thing that uh, you do and uh, it's so meaningful to the guests that come here today. Um, we receive a lot of uh, expressions of gratitude from them and we know that it's a huge blessing to them. So thank you for being uh, present to them, um, to show your warm welcome and love and to let them know there's a home here at Neighborville uh, that they can uh, be amongst us and we're just glad to have them. So again, thank you for uh, spending your time and, and giving your support and making this event a great success. Make sure to stop by our information center to find information on our community groups and other ways you can get involved here at Naperville. Uh, if we haven't had a chance to say welcome, or welcome to everyone this morning. Um, great to see everyone here, especially if you're visiting with us. Uh, if you are a visitor, uh, please... Uh, uh, speak to somebody this morning. Let us uh, hang around. Let us speak to you. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better, and uh, we're really excited that you're here today. Um, let's let's go to our our Father in prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much this morning for for this day that you set aside for us. Uh, we thank you for your your command to. To come here as, as one church this morning and, and to worship you and to lift up your name, to remember your sacrifice, to, uh, to talk about the, <clears throat> the good works that, that you want us to do and, and to reflect on our own lives and recharge our batteries for, for the world that we live in. God, we thank you so much for this church and the resources that are that are given by you through this church. We thank you for uh, the ministers here. We thank you for the leadership in this church. God, we thank you for all the good things that, that this church is involved in. Um, God, we, we ask you to be with us as, as servants of yours. Uh, please, please prick our hearts to, to want to be more involved, to want to, to do more in serving you to serving your people, and to furthering your kingdom. God, we, we, we all know we can do more, and so we, we ask you to, um, to please be with us to look at our own lives and to decide, you know, how can we do more to, um, to, to further your kingdom, God. God, we thank you for everyone in this congregation. Um, we ask you to uh, be with our sister Carla Anderson as she is having surgery tomorrow. Uh, we ask you to be with other members of this congregation who are ill uh, or that can't be with us today. Um, God, for everyone that can be with us today, we thank you for them. We thank you for their families. Uh, we thank you for the, 
the uplifting support that, that we receive by being here in each other's company. Um, God, we know how hard it is to live in this world and to uh, resist the temptations that are around us every day. And God, I just want to thank you so much for a, a great family to have uh, near us at all times to come together and to talk about common goals and uh, common struggles, and we thank you for that, God. God, be with us today as, as we go through worship. Uh, please, please help our minds to be in the right place. Uh, please help us to always be thankful for what you have done for us and what you're continuing to do for us. God, most of all, we thank you for loving us. Even when we're unlovable at times, we thank you for continuing to, to pour out love on us, and please help us to always do the same to others. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. <clears throat> Yield not to temptation for your
to share with you a very big problem that's been in my life. You see, my creator is holy, perfect, righteous, and pure. And I am very flawed. I'm very sinful. I tend to disappoint, frustrate, irritate, and even hurt people I love. So what I need is atonement, cleansing. I need forgiveness from God. So what am I going to do? The answer is surprisingly little. I'm just going to reach out and accept what God has done for me. Let me read an Old Testament passage that I think just beautifully summarizes what God has done for me. I'm reading from Ezekiel chapter 36. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. The water and the spirit. God says that he will forgive all my sins. And he uses a metaphorical language, I'm going to sprinkle you with clean water. But you know, if that is all that God did for me, I would still be stuck living my life as me. So he does it even more. He says, I'm going to give you a new spirit. I'm going to put a new heart in you. And it will be as different as a living, beating heart is from a cold, dead stone. And how does God do that? He gives me his spirit, capital S. And what the Holy Spirit does, it moves me to obey him. In my nature, I move away from obedience. I move towards sin. But with the power of God's spirit, I now move towards obedience. Now it is my new natural tendency to obey God. In fact, I'm not even, I am not happy unless I am obeying God. Hundreds of years later, Jesus is talking to a man named Nicodemus. And he says, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Does that sound familiar, familiar to anyone? Apparently it was not familiar to Nicodemus because he says, how can that be? Jesus responds, you are Israel's teacher and you don't understand this? Grammatically, Jesus actually said, uses what's called the definite article. He says, Nicodemus, you are the teacher of Israel. We can infer that Nicodemus was probably one of the top rabbinical scholars of his nation, but he couldn't track what Jesus was saying. But now, any Christian in this room knows that it was not with some metaphorical sprinkling of water that our sins are forgiven. It was by the real dying blood of Jesus. Jesus shed his blood on the cross because we cannot have a relationship with God unless our sins are forgiven. God lives in eternal purity. So, but Jesus was, loves us enough that he was willing to die for our sins. So as we take the bread, which represents Jesus' broken body, as we take the fruit of the vine, which represents Jesus' blood, let God's Spirit move you to appreciate and to love Jesus. Because that is when Christianity gets easy. Ask any good parent in here. It is easy, it is joyful to lovingly sacrifice for someone you love. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your love for us as we remember Jesus on the cross. Help our hearts to be moved to understand how much you love us and let us love you in return. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
you would please uh, sign the attendance roster and pass it over to your neighbor. Now is the time in our worship service where we take a collection uh, for our church. Now there are a number of reasons why I regularly give a contribution to my church. And let me share one of them. And this reason is actually rather self-serving. See, in my nature, I am greedy. I am selfish. I like new stuff. My friend comes up and shows me his new car. What I say is like, wow, I'm really happy for you. What I'm feeling is like, ah, I want a new car. Let's call that my sinful nature. What I discovered years and years ago is that if I give God back $1 for every $10 he gives me, it has a way of kind of putting limits on my sinful nature. It weakens it. It frustrates it. It's almost as if I can say to my sinful nature, sinful nature, sit in that corner and shut up. I'm not listening to you anymore. It's funny, uh, last, yesterday I was kind of running through this uh, speech with my wife. I'm kind of looking at her kind of nervous. And she said, Bruce, that is not good social language. You should not say shut up in church. So I'm sorry, Kumi. Let's pray for the contribution. Father God, it's an honor to give back to you. Please bless this offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is time for our children Bible hour. If there are our little ones, as we all stand, as the kids listen to Bible hour. How many of us know two wings out here? Okay. Bass. I want two wings, two wings, to veil my face. I want two wings, two wings, to veil my feet. I want two wings, two wings, to fly away. Cause the world can do me no harm. I want two wings, two wings, to veil my face. I want two wings, two wings, to veil my feet. I want two wings, two wings. To fly away, cause the world can do me no harm. Everybody say, two wings to bear my face. Two wings to bear my feet. Two wings to fly away, cause the world can do me no harm. Say it again now. Two
with us this morning. Thanks so much for spending time with us here this morning. If there's anything we can do to be of service to you, please let us know. We'd love to have the opportunity to visit with you after our service today. Uh, Let's go to the Father in prayer. Uh, Father, it's been a great morning, just a wonderful morning to be able to join together to fellowship, to encourage one another, to lift up our voices, to praise you. Uh, For you are the one who's worthy of all of our honor and glory. You are our God. You are our caring Father. You are our friend and our Savior. And we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Father, we thank you for the outpouring of your Spirit. And we pray that the Spirit is working powerfully among us this morning, especially as we open up your word and we seek to hear a word from you today. May your Spirit shape and form our lives and help us to become the people that you've called us to be. And Father, it's our heart's desire as a church that we make an impact upon the community around us. And Father, as we're praying throughout this year, we pray that it's a that you're preparing the hearts of people to hear the message of Jesus Christ. And not only that, that for us as a church and for us individually, that you are showing us exactly what you want us to do next, the type of relationships that you want us to step into or who you want us to serve and how to best do that. And as Father, as you clarify that for us, we pray that you will give us courage and a sense of boldness uh, to step into those situations and to proclaim the name of Jesus, for it's the name of Jesus that truly impacts the lives of people. Uh, Father, we thank you again for your word, and may we be sensitive to what you have to say to us today. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. In 1853, Queen Victoria called upon a somewhat controversial doctor by the name of Sir James Simpson to assist her with the delivery of her ninth child. Uh, Simpson, who is now regarded as the father of modern anesthesia, on that occasion, for the very first time, used chloroform to numb the queen's pain. And so, men, this morning, you now know who you owe a debt of gratitude to if your wife did not curse your name while going through childbirth due to an epidural block. It was Dr. James Simpson. Not only did he make huge advancements in the area of anesthesia, but that was not all when it came to childbirth. He played a significant role in advancing in the area of fighting infection as well as developing, inventing, and developing the better use of delivery tools. On one particular occasion, this accomplished doctor was approached by a group of young scientists, and they really had a question for him, and their question was this. They said, Dr. Simpson, out of all the wonderful things that you've done in your career, out of all the amazing discoveries that you've come upon, what would you consider to be your most important, your greatest? They anticipated, no doubt, that he would mention the use of chloroform, or maybe that he would mention a better use of delivery tool like forceps, or maybe even the vacuum suction exterior, which was pivotal in addressing certain childbirth problems, but he didn't mention any of those discoveries. Instead, with tears welling in his eyes, Dr. Simpson spoke these words. He said, young men, the greatest discovery I've ever made is that Jesus Christ is my Savior, and that is by far the most important thing a person can ever come to know. Now, long before Dr. Simpson spoke those words, there was a commercial fisherman 
who came to the exact same conclusion. And this particular fisherman, John, he wrote a brief account of the life of Jesus because it became his heart's desire for every single person to discover the rich life found in Jesus Christ. And so in his gospel, in John chapter 20, he explains exactly why he has written this story for us. And he says in verse 30 through 31, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This morning as we continue our journey through the Gospel of John, we're introduced to some of the very first individuals who discovered Jesus Christ. They go by the name of Andrew and Peter and Philip and Nathaniel and an unnamed fisherman who's regarded as the author of this book, John. These were the very first, among the very first to discover just this amazing person in Jesus and how exactly did that take place? How did they come to recognize Christ or to learn about Him? Well, for many of these men, at least for two, Andrew and John, they initially heard the preaching of a man by the name of John the Baptist. They heard his personal testimony. As many of you know, we'll just call him JB, but JB was an eccentric guy. He was, he was a powerful preacher, though, and his preaching attracted people from far and wide to the desert to hear him preach. And so many of these individuals who heard John the Baptist preach, they were so moved by his powerful preaching that they made the decision to be baptized and then become disciples of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, in many ways, was a celebrity preacher before celebrity preachers were even a thing. He enjoyed tremendous success. But with success, there also comes some danger, as you know. One of the great dangers that comes to a person who is successful is this, is that they begin to believe all of their press clippings. We see it happen all the time, don't we? A a person experiences a measure, a degree of success, and all of a sudden they begin to think and begin to act as if life is all about them. Now, it would have been easy, not surprising at all, if John the Baptist would have fallen into this trap, but that did not happen to him. And nowhere is this more evident than in his response when a group of religious authorities came to him and they questioned his identity, but not only that, they questioned the authority behind the things that he was doing. John the Baptist responded to them in this way in John chapter 1, and verse 19 through 27. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leader sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I'm not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I'm the one calling in the, di- in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent to question him, they asked this, or they questioned him, why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Not only was John the Baptist quick to point out that he was not who many thought, even hoped he was, but he went on to mention that I'm nothing compared to the one who is coming. In fact, what John the Baptist says is is basically this, that when you look at the coming one next to him, I'm not even worthy to do the most menial task, the task that the lowest household slave would carry out for this particular individual. I'm not worthy to wash his feet. Now, what was it that John the Baptist saw in Jesus that made all of his accomplishments and all of his successes seem insignificant in comparison? I want you to listen to the testimony of John the Baptist in John chapter 1 and verse 29. Says the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Our culture is not one that likes to talk much about sin. In fact, in many ways, there are those who would suggest that sin is a word that we should no longer use. We just need to eliminate it from our vocabulary. It brings shame, it brings hurt to people. So let's just not let's not even mention the word sin. In fact, just a few weeks ago, the New York Times ran an article, and the headline was simply this, Raising Children Without the Concept of Sin. 
This is kind of a thing that you're raising children so they don't hear the word sin, that they don't understand sin, that they're not aware of it. And that's supposedly a good thing. Now, whether we want to recognize it or not, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, sin is still our greatest problem. It is a far greater problem than border control or global warming or national debt or who's going to be the fifth starter in the Cubs rotation this spring. It is a major issue. And why is sin a major issue? It is a major issue because it is the one problem, it is the one issue that we cannot fix on our own. And Bruce alluded to it this morning in his comments. There's no possible way. It doesn't matter how brilliant you are. It doesn't matter how... uh, talented you are, it doesn't matter how articulate you are, how popular you are, how rich you are, how successful you are, there is nothing that we can do to make up for the many, many times and all the different ways that we have rebelled against God. There's nothing that we can do on our own to fix the the gap, the, the distance between a holy God and a sinful people. Nothing. But what we cannot do on our own, Jesus came to do for us. Jesus, the Lamb of God, atoned for our sins by giving up His life on the cross. While there's no way that John the Baptist had Jesus' sacrificial death in mind when he spoke those words, he was quick to recognize, he was quick to see something in Jesus that told him that he is the one and the only one who can deal with the sin problem in the world. And because that is who Jesus is, John recognized that he is far greater than I am, that I don't even compare to him because I can't fix it, but Jesus can. And the second reason that John the Baptist held Jesus in such high regard is because he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ was the promised one of God, the chosen one of God. Now, did he always know this? No, he didn't always know this for a significant period of time in his life. He had no clue that Jesus was the one prophesied about in the Old Testament. But then something happened six weeks prior to what we read about in John chapter 1. He said, what happened six weeks earlier? This is what happened. John baptized Jesus. When John the Baptist baptized Jesus, even though he was terribly unworthy and he knew that, When he baptized Jesus, something remarkable happened upon in that moment that confirmed in his mind that this is exactly the person that all the Jewish people have been anticipating, looking forward to for centuries upon centuries. What took place? Let's read about this in John chapter 1, verse 32 through 34. John's testimony again. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me. The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I've seen and testified that this is God's chosen one. The Old Testament's full of stories of people who receive this Holy Spirit for a a special work. So they're given the Holy Spirit, they'd go out and do what God wanted them to do. But the Holy Spirit was just given to them for a season of time. What John begins to realize is that when Jesus comes out of the baptistry and the Holy Spirit descends on him, the Holy Spirit remains upon Jesus. And when he sees this, he begins to recognize this is confirmation that Jesus Christ is the one promised by God, that he is the Messiah, that he is the new king, that he is the one that's going to lead people out of bondage and into a new life. And this is why Jesus is different than anyone else. This is why he is so much greater than I am, John says. And and for at least a year, John prepared the hearts of people to receive their new king by calling them to repent of their sins. It's the exact same way that we get ready to receive Jesus as well, that that we make the decision that we're going to repent. Now, that doesn't mean that we never sin again. That doesn't mean that we're perfect. That doesn't mean we have to clean up our life and get everything right until we can receive Jesus. But what it means is this, that I'm going to make a decision in my life, that I'm not going to do life according to my will, but I'm going to start seeking the will of God and following Him. 
And so John realized there's one greater than I am who's coming after me, even though he was before me. He is the one who can take away the sins of the world. He is the one that is chosen by God. He's the new king and the Messiah. And we need to get ready to receive him by saying, we're not going to follow our will, but we're going to follow the will of God. And he just preaches this over and over again. For the past couple of weeks, I've been thinking a lot about John the Baptist. I've been so absolutely amazed by this man's willingness to play front man for someone else for his entire career. I've been astounded by his willingness to, to not worry about building his own brand, by not thinking about how can I get a few more likes on Instagram or a few more followers on Twitter. Can you imagine the notoriety he might have enjoyed if he would have had the right social media firm behind him? But he didn't, and he didn't care. Because his only desire in life was really for people to come to know Jesus, to discover Jesus. That's all that he wanted. I've been thinking a lot about John the Baptist over the past couple of weeks, but mostly I've been thinking about this, how different the two of us are. Let me explain. A few days ago, I had breakfast with Jeff Folk. We have breakfast from time to time. and So we're sitting having breakfast Jeff asked me this question. He said, hey, Sean, have you ever heard so-and-so, he named somebody, he said, have you ever heard so-and-so preach? And after I shared that I had heard this man preach before, he enthusiastically said something to me along the lines of, wow, that guy is really, really good. I mean, he is really, really good. And in that moment, Jeff did what so many church members love to do with their minister, and that is they love to get with their minister and talk about how good some other minister is and about all the great things that some other church is doing. On more than one occasion, I've had somebody catch me after a service and say, have you heard so-and-such preach? And I'll say, yes, I've heard so-and-such preach. And they'll say this, I wish I could listen to him every week. <laughs> and I think to myself, I wish you could too. And I'm praying God will move you. And I have to admit, in those conversations, I, I walk away and I have this fantasy go through my mind. And my fantasy is this, is that I can find the name of somebody that does the exact job you do, and the next time we're together, I talk about that person the entire conversation. So it sounds kind of like this, hey, Jeff, have you ever heard of Bob Schmillenhauser? Uh, Bob works Creative Design Solutions. That's his firm, and he makes the most awe-inspiring designs I've ever seen in my life. He's the most gifted designer I have ever bumped into, and his firm, the firm he works for, is second to none. How's business going for you, Jeff? That's kind of the fantasy, and I was having this fantasy when I got in my Jeep after our breakfast, and that's when the Holy Spirit interrupted me. And the Holy Spirit interrupted me with this thought, and the thought was, Sean, why are you so upset? Jesus is the story, not you. And the only thing, the only thing that matters is people are moved towards Jesus. And it does not matter who God chooses to use, whether it's a preacher or a church, to move the hearts of people towards Jesus. You ought to be absolutely thrilled. Jesus is the only one that matters. That's the way it should always be. It should only be about Jesus. I have no doubt that it was because of his total disregard for self, his disregard for his name and his fame, that Jesus spoke these words about John in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11. I tell you, truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Greatness is about making much of Jesus. And we have the opportunity to make much of Jesus anytime somebody recognizes the great things that we're doing. It's exactly what Dr. Or Sir James Simpson did when he was questioned by those young scientists. Hey, tell us all about your greatest discovery. And he made the decision, it's not about me. I'm not going to talk about me or what I've discovered. It's all about Jesus. And so he talked about Jesus on that particular occasion. And you have the same opportunity when people come to you and they want to know about some of the things that you've achieved and the reason for those things. 
How does this play out? Well, let me give you a couple of examples. Maybe it's when a neighbor comes to you and says, hey, listen, I've just been watching your family, and I'm really so moved by the closeness of your family. It's different than ours. You you seem to really care about each other. You seem to really enjoy each other. You seem to have a great marriage, or you're raising great kids, and can you share with me the secret? And maybe we're tempted a little bit to talk about what we're doing right as parents, but that's a great opportunity to talk about Christ. And so it may sound something like this. Hey, thank you so much for for your nice words, but I but I want to I just got to share this with you that I'm a follower of Jesus. And then what Jesus did for me on the cross and giving up his life to forgive me of my sins, it left for me this beautiful picture of what it means to really uh, care about someone, what it means to sacrifice for someone else, what it means to love, what it means to forgive in the family. And so that's really what I've, we're simply trying to model our lives on. When somebody comes to you in your workplace and says, I just want to congratulate you on all your accomplishments in the marketplace, you're doing a remarkable job. It's an opportunity for us to pause and kind of step back and and, and say it's not really about us, but to simply say thank you, I I really appreciate that, but i got to let you in on a little secret. The secret is this, that all the awards and all the the house and the car and and the money, that's all going away. Because of what my Savior Jesus Christ has done for me, dying on the cross and taking away my sins, I know that I'm going to spend the rest of eternity with Him, and that's truly what energizes my life. That's what's important. I imagine you're sitting here this morning and thinking, that just sounds corny, preacher. There's no way I'm doing that. And I, I get that. I don't know if those are the best examples. What I'm asking, though, is for us as a people to think creatively about how in those moments we move the spotlight off of ourselves and we put the spotlight where it belongs on our Savior, Redeemer, Jesus Christ. That we put the spotlight on the one that is greater than we. We put it on Christ because He is the one and the only one that deserves the recognition. And not only did these men hear, or at least two of these men hear John the Baptist preach, but every single one of these individuals had the opportunity eventually to have a personal encounter with Christ. Andrew and John had the opportunity, it appears, to hang out with Jesus for an entire night. Peter, Philip, Nathaniel, they shared what appears to be a much briefer conversation, but at the end, the result was the same. That after spending time with Jesus, they came to the recognition, this guy's unlike anyone else. There's something special about him. And after spending time with Jesus, Andrew and John proclaimed, we found the Messiah. Philip announced, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. And Nathaniel, after spending time with Jesus, said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. It did not take much time in the presence of Jesus for them to recognize that they were in the midst of royalty, that they were in the midst of the new king, of the Messiah, of the promised one of God, for them to recognize that He's the one, the only one, the special one, and this discovery that they had just made, it was worth giving up everything for. And so Andrew and John made the decision, we're not going to be disciples of John the Baptist any longer, we're going to be disciples of Jesus. And Andrew and John and Philip and Peter, they made the decision, we have found the one we've been searching for, everybody's been searching for, so we're going to walk away from our occupation of being fishermen and we're going to follow Jesus. And Nathaniel makes the decision after making this great discovery, you know what, it's all about Jesus and so I'm going to give up some of my long-held beliefs and understanding about the way faith works and I'm going to base it all on the teachings and the manner of Jesus Christ. Because when you understand who Jesus is, and you understand what Jesus has done, and you understand what Jesus offers, you begin to realize that everything else in life pales in comparison. Now, one of the ways that we have the opportunity to help move people in the direction of Jesus is by asking a very simple question. What's the question? What's the question that Jesus asked of Andrew of John in John chapter 1 and verse 38? Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? It's not an insignificant question. What Jesus is really asking in that moment is, what do you wish? What are you searching for? Perhaps it's one of the best ways for us to start a spiritual conversation with someone else. Simply ask the question, what is it that you really want in life? 
What is it that you're searching for? Now, if a person is honest and vulnerable, there's a good chance that their response will probably come back to something like this. What is it that I want? What I really want is just a little bit of happiness. What I really want is some peace. What I really want is purpose in life. What I really want is a friendship. What I really want is love. What I really want is to be able to let go of the shame that I feel in my life. What I want is forgiveness. The exciting news is this, is that we know where to point people for them to find what they're looking for. His name is Jesus Christ. And they may not know that they're searching for Jesus Christ, but we understand that they are because it is only in Jesus that our deepest needs can be met. Now, when Philip recognized that Jesus was the one that he had been searching for all of his life, notice what he did. He went to Nathanael. In John chapter 1 and verse 45 through 46, we read these words. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. Philip invited Nathanael to meet Jesus. We should be a people who do the same. Now, obviously, we don't have the opportunity to invite our friends to come have a personal encounter in a physical sense with Jesus Christ, right? We understand that, but at the same time, we have the opportunity to meet Jesus, for people to meet Jesus. One of the primary ways to do that is uh, in our lives, obviously, as the Holy Spirit indwells us and works through us, and we try to represent Christ in the way that we think and act and live. But beyond that, we have the opportunity to introduce people to Jesus in Scripture, right? And so it's one of the primary reasons that we need to continue to invite people to settings like this, to invite people to worship service, that we invite people to our community group setting, that we invite people to a youth group setting, anywhere that people have the opportunity to be exposed to the story of Jesus in Scripture, because that's where they meet Him. But perhaps the best thing that we can possibly do is Just invite somebody to sit down and study the Bible with us, to open up Scripture and to engage in the Bible study one-on-one with us. And and there are people who are willing to do so. I'm reminded of this on a regular basis. I I try not to do this often, but I'll do it here real quickly. I'm going to brag on my parents for just a moment. I was talking to them the other night. They were getting ready. I said, what are you doing tonight? They said, we're having a Bible study. I said, Bible study? Okay, well, who are you having a Bible study with? Well, we're having our Bible study with our neighbors. It's kind, of, it's kind of a common occurrence. Well, how'd this come about? Well, we were just kind of talking about church and spiritual things or whatever, and so we invited them. I said, do you want to have a Bible study at our house? And they said, sure, we'd love to. And it's amazing that they're just willing to open up and, and invite people. How many people say, well, yeah, that's something I'd like to do. There are people around us who are willing to say yes to that because they're searching. They've looked everywhere else, they've tried it, they've looked everywhere else, they've looked for it in success and popularity and, and money and all these things and that there's still this emptiness inside of them and they're searching and there's just this possibility maybe, maybe, just maybe Jesus is the answer and so they're open. And so as we close this morning, I simply want to encourage us as a people to begin to pray simply in this way, that God, that you will make clear to us who you have prepared to accept that invitation. Make clear to us who you have prepared to accept that invitation. And as you pray that and the Holy Spirit begins to move your heart in a certain direction, that maybe it's this person at work or maybe it's this person at school or maybe it's this person in your neighborhood that God's preparing, that when you get that sense of movement by the Holy Spirit, that you step into that moment and you offer the invite. Would you think about having a Bible study with me, would you be interested? I I make no guarantees that they say yes. I make no guarantees that they don't laugh at you, nothing like that, but there is a chance. If God's working and we're praying and we're humble enough to step into it, that there's going to be somebody that says, I would love to. And may this time a year from now, we see some new faces right here among us that are part of the family of God because we followed the leading of the Holy Spirit. And we've shared the one who is far greater 
than we. Let's pray together. Father, this is our prayer. We know that you're working on the hearts of people because you have told us in Scripture that you desire for every single person to come to know you. We know that you're chasing after people the way you chased after our hearts. We pray that you will open our eyes this week, that you'll give us ears to hear the Holy Spirit, to know if there are people in our midst in which you prepare for this moment, give us the courage to simply invite somebody to sit down and maybe read scripture with us or to have a spiritual conversation. May we share the same desire of John, that we want all people to know Christ. May we share the same conviction of John the Baptist, that all people need to know Jesus because he is truly the one and only who is worthy of everything. Thank you, Christ, for coming into this world to atone for our sins, to lead us out of bondage into new life. It is through your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for being with us this morning. Uh, this morning, if you would like to respond in any way uh, by giving your life to Jesus Christ in baptism, we'd love to minister to you in that way. Or if you'd like the prayers of this church family, uh, we'd be honored to pray with you today. If we can serve you in either of those ways, we invite you to come to the front as we stand and sing this song together. <coughs> Have you been to Jesus for that cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusted in His grace to His power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? In the soul cleansing blood. Are they one?
Al just mentioned uh, requested that we pray for his mom. She's having more health difficulties, and so uh, please keep her in your prayers this week. We'd really appreciate that. Then Anne Marie Mitchell mentioned a, a friend of hers, uh, her friend's mother. Her name is Brenda Pardilla. On Thursday, she found out that she has skin cancer, and so we want to pray for the Pardilla family, uh, and especially Brenda at this time. I'm going to ask you, as you was mentioned in our prayer this morning, Carla Anderson is going to have surgery tomorrow, and so please be praying for her that all goes well, that she feels much better soon. We also want to be praying for a student, a Harding University student, Mary Jo Erbeline. Uh, she was on her way home for spring break and was in a very serious car accident, and she is in critical condition at this time. And so please be praying for Mary Jo and her family. We want to pray for Autumn this morning. For many of you, if you visited with Autumn, you know that she faces uh, several different health challenges, and it seems that they just keep finding more and more, and it is taxing for her. And so please be praying for her as she deals with this, not just physically, but also emotionally and spiritually, because it's, a, it's just a really a difficult season that she's been in for quite some time. And so, Autumn, no, I wish there was something we could do, but know that you're surrounded by people who really love you and want to lift you up in prayer. And then uh, this morning I want to share a note with you from Bob Perkins. And again, I want to express sympathy, uh, our sympathy to Bob and the passing of his mom. Our service was this past Thursday, and Bob asked me to share these words with the church. He said, to our Naperville Church of Christ family, we'd like to express our deepest gratitude for your prayers and support during this difficult time. Your prayers and kind words have touched us beyond what we can describe. We'd also like to thank those that attended the funeral, even though they had never met my mother. We'd especially like to thank our small group for their support. You are truly gifts from God. So thank you for, thank you for this church just being family to one another. Uh, that's why we, one of the reasons we come together and appreciate the way that you love on one another through the very different challenges of life. Uh, let's go to the Father in prayer. Father, we do thank you for, in your wisdom, uh, establishing the church recognizing that you have created us to be people who need relationships and community and that you put this in place so that we can be here for one another uh, during the very challenging times of life through the times when life doesn't make any sense to us and times that we want to kind of give up. You've also given us community to be able to celebrate with each other so that when things go well we have one another to really to share in that joy with and we're grateful for that Father. My prayer would be, Father, if there are those among us who are on, kind of on the fringes here on Sunday mornings but don't have deeper connections, that, that they'll find ways to engage with more people because it's such a blessing to be able to do life together. And may we as a church family do what we can to be just as open as we possibly can and loving towards one another so that every single person feels wanted and needed and welcomed in this space you know, as part of this family. And if there are things that are in the way at this time, please help us to recognize that. Help us to open our eyes to move those out of the way because we want to be the family of God. We want to be the one body of Christ. And Father, as you've heard this morning and you are so aware, you always, always know before we do, that the challenges that are going on in the lives of people, we, we pray for your blessing to be upon them. Father, I pray that you'll continue to be with the Perkins family. I pray that you'll continue to comfort them and just give them your strength and your your blessing as they get used to this new way of life and missing uh, one that meant so much to them. Please uh, ease the pain that they feel right now. And Father, I pray that you'll be with Autumn and the many different challenges that she continues to face. And it seems like every other day she gets news of something else that's causing problems for her physically. And, and I pray that she can get through this season that as the doctors take care of her and as she goes through the different uh, surgeries and different uh, treatments, that she'll feel a whole lot better and that there'll be a, a much better day coming, a day in which she enjoys good health. I pray that you'll strengthen her emotionally and I pray that you'll strengthen her spiritually. Father, we know that when we're hurting physically, that that is a prime time when the evil one really works on our hearts, works on our spiritually, trying to move us away from you. But I pray that during this season that the autumn and move closer and closer to you in every way. And Father, in the moments when she can't find the words to speak to you, may we carry her in prayer. May we stand in the gap for her and speak on her behalf to you. And Father, I pray that you will please be with Brenda Pardilla. We pray that you'll heal her from the cancer. 
We pray that you'll be with her family as they're very scared about the diagnosis that's been given, and rightfully so. We pray that you'll give them a moment of hope and that you'll give them people around them that can encourage them, but we, we do pray that you'll give her healing. Father, I pray that you'll be with Carla. Thank you so much for getting her back from Montana and back to Chicago. We pray that the surgery tomorrow will go really well and that she'll feel better soon. We pray that you'll be with the family as they anticipate and wait for her to come out of surgery. And Father, we pray for Mary Jo. We're so saddened by for what's happened to her over the past few days, and we, we desperately plead with you that you will bring her out of critical condition and that you'll give her many more years of life and that she'll uh, be restored to uh, a meaningful life. We pray for her classmates. We pray for the faculty there at Harding. We pray for her parents and family and friends. We just pray that you'll help them through this very difficult, trying time. And Father, we pray for all these things asking that when good things happen, that it might bring glory to your name, that it might give us reason to speak about your faithfulness and goodness and the way that you intercede on our behalf. But at the same time, Father, when things don't turn out exactly the way we want them to, may we still give glory to your name. For you are the one who gave your life for us, and you are the one who walked out of the tomb for us, and you are the one who is coming back for us, and one day everything will be right and made new. And we rest in that, Father. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you again for joining us this morning. I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing this last song together. Have a great day.